eventually I started drinking in the morning and 24 seven alcohol and cocaine around the clock. And the cocaine was not for fun. None of this was fun. Sure. <laughs> Some people have said to me, oh, the party had to end sometime. And I'm always <laughs> like, what party? Yeah. I wasn't there. Are you ready? Are you shitty down? Season four of the Shine Up podcast, absolutely terrific guests. My take on what's happening in the world of divorce. Are the stakes high? You better believe it. The unfiltered and real take on what divorce is like from the absolute best professionals. Life, love, marriage, divorce, relationships, finances. Topics that far too often many people shy away from. But, but not, not here, here on, on the, the Shine, Shine Up podcast. podcast. Episode 76 of the Shine Up Podcast. I'm Evan Shine. We have an absolutely phenomenal show this week. And coming up, I am joined on this week's episode of the podcast by Lisa Smith. She's the author of the acclaimed memoir, Girl Walks Out of a Bar. Lisa is a recovery coach, author, writer, former practicing attorney. And she was named one of New York Law Journal's 2020 Trailblazers. And she's absolutely great. And Dave, how good is that conversation? which we recorded the other day with Lisa Smith. Terrific. She's a pro. I've listened to her podcast, and she was great on our podcast as well. And Dave, we had some fun. Lisa has an incredible story. It's inspiring. It is absolutely brilliant. And she's a big lover of rock and roll music, which I know you are too. I know. I'm looking forward to talking to Lisa with a little bit of rock and roll as well as her her journey has been quite a thing. And you name it, she's been through it. She's been through a, a tough divorce. She's been through addiction. And talk about someone who's really got her stuff together now. She does. And Dave, let's talk about someone else who has her stuff together. That's you, my friend. Producer <laughs> Dave, I know you have an awesome doctor prepared for this week's episode, as we always do. Let's fire it up. And now, let's see what's on the docket. A jam-packed edition of the docket today, Evan, three great items, starting with the first one, which comes to us from msnbc.com. Item, Item one. one. This is an uh, opinion piece written by Liz Lenz. The headline reads, America's exhausting cycle of deja vu might be coming for Benefer. That, of course, refers to... Ben Affleck and Jennifer Lopez, celebrity fascinations, the article says, tend to reveal more about the culture than the celebrities themselves. What did you think about this one? Hey, if I got to tell you, I love it. And I'm fired up for the summer of Jennifer. I mean, normally it's the summer of your Red Sox or my Yankees or baseball. But I got to tell you, it's the summer of Benifer. It's here, right? We said goodbye to Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt, and we put their divorce and their saga which was never ending, right? Mm. We say goodbye to them. And now it's on to these two. And I love it. I love it. People are obsessed with these two. We are obsessed as a society with this celebrity breakup. Are they going to get married? Are they going to stay together? Are they going to get divorced? The rumor mill is officially in full force. And Dave, I got to tell you, I love it. <laughs> well, it, it, it is something that you can follow just like you follow in sports I mean, one day your beloved yankees are in first place they're doing right well as the time very well at the time of this recording and in and then sometimes they might not be doing so well and i feel like we got to keep checking in on ben affleck and jennifer lopez because at any given time i it's like i forget are they together or are they not together anymore came back into her life in recent years and now he might be on the way out so i really thought those kids had a chance of it well, Dave, let me ask you, yep. what is it about the celebrity split, right, that makes us as a society so obsessed, so enamored with their lives? What is it? I think part of it is that old thing as the People magazine would say, look at they're just like us, meaning we think they live these charmed lives, and they do. They they We'd all be jealous to trade places with them for a little while to be a, a movie star, to be wealthy beyond our dreams. And yet, sometimes we can look at them and say, ugh, that must be tough now. They're public, possible divorce, but they're splitting up possible for the second time in 
So you think they get out of bed every day and say, hey, look at me, I'm a celebrity, what a great day I'm having, but maybe not so much. And so there's a little bit of schadenfreude there in this sort of, we have to admit, we're taking a little bit of delight in their misery, at least momentarily. Dave, give us a prediction. Give us, <laughs> give us stay together. No, I say sorry, Benifer. Benifer's no more, but I look forward to the third time they get together. Well, I got to <laughs> tell you, you know how I knew things were up, right? And you know how I knew Ben Affleck, the marriage was on the rocks. I got to tell you, the Tom Brady roast, right, which I thought was absolutely fantastic. I have watched it in full about three times. I thought the comedians were fantastic, were great, funny. I thought it was it was tremendous. Kevin Hart, Ben Affleck was terrible. I mean, this guy was absolutely awful. I don't know if he wrote his own jokes, if he had someone write the jokes. Regardless, he was the worst one mm-hmm. who took the mic by far. Bill Belichick, who is as mm-hmm. you know, was right. is the driest person, was better. And you're not saying something, right? So, look, Ben Affleck was terrible. Maybe it's the the rocky marriage to blame. Maybe. But yeah. did you see the roast? Yeah, of course, I saw it, and you're absolutely right. And it, this should have been a layup for Ben Affleck, huge Boston sports fan like me. He ha- he was in the most hilarious Super Bowl commercial with Tom Brady and Matt Damon. That was a blast. So all he has to come in and, and sh- show his Boston love and make a couple jokes at the expense of Tom Brady, and he went off the rails. He was he was he was borderline incoherent or just disorganized or something he kept going on about some anonymous social media villain nobody seemed to care it was a relief when he got off the stage (laughs) and the last thing on this topic what'd you make of the whole jennifer lopez canceling her summer tour i know you were probably bummed out because not many people are as big of a j-lo fan than you and i'm sure you had a handful of concerts but you know we talk about how divorce it's such a trying time it's such an emotional time it's a full-time job it affects you mentally it affects you physically it affects your ability to work and then you have a a megastar like j-lo essentially canceling her summer tour to spend time with her family your thoughts yeah it, it it's one of the downsides of being a celebrity for sure in that if if you're going through a divorce and you're a professional, you're a business owner, you're an average Joe, it's going to be terrible, but the whole world doesn't know about it. You can probably take some time off if you've got a situation that allows you to do that. J-Lo can't take some time off without the whole world knowing, and sadly, without disappointing a lot of her fans. So uh, I understand it, of course, but the whole thing's a bummer. We hope for happier days ahead for J-Lo. And we move on, Evan, to item two. Item two comes to us from the New York Post. Headline reads, Darren Waller drops emotional song after Kelsey Plum divorce. So Darren Waller, Giants tight end, one of your favorites, Evan, I'm sure, is peeling back the curtain on his personal life in a unique way. And your thoughts on what he did, Evan? First, let me me say this. We have an incredible celebrity being docked today, which I absolutely love. And Darren Waller. What a bust on the field. I was expecting bigger things, right? Bigger things when he stepped on the field for the New York Giants, my football team. As I'm going to tell you, as I listen to the way his divorce unfolded, I'm totally confused, Mm. right? He put up cryptic messages on social media. There's reports. He put out this song. There's a little back and forth with his Soon to be X, right? He said, she said, the way this unfolded in the public eye just gave me this feeling of confusion. And the question I would throw back to Darren Waller is why? Mm. Right? Why would you do this when you're going through the process? Why would you invite the attention? Why would you invite the online world, which look exists? Why would you put it out there through songs and leave? their fans and leave people wondering, are they going to separate? Are they going to get divorced? What does this mean? And you invite a response from your wife. It's just, I think it was silly. Taking a listen to the song now. He's got the auto tune turned up to 11 on the song because <laughs> I don't know if he can, Carry a, carry a tune as well as he can carry a football. 
But I think the person who said it better than anyone is this random commenter to the YouTube video who says, oh, Darren, you think you were stabbed in the back? I took you on my fantasy football team three times. and got nothing in return. I don't know about Kelsey, but I'll never take you back. <laughs> what a shame. Yeah, like I said, he was a total bust on the field. Yeah. I mean, he's been letting down giant fans and fantasy football owners for, for the past past few years. Yeah, I, I guess the song, I guess he would say that this is his way of dealing with it. But it's odd. It it's He needed a minister of common sense on his team to come to him and say, you're probably going to regret this a uh, couple years down the road, if not a couple days down the road. <laughs> Do you agree? I do agree. Yeah. And look, once it's out there, it's out there. Yeah. Right? So again, like this song, you're inviting feedback. And look, he probably doesn't care, you know, who comments on the YouTube video or social media, but it's perception. And when you put yourself out there, when you're a celebrity, when you're a professional athlete, and you're going through such a public divorce, I think you need to be super careful as to what you put out there. And we move on to item three. Item, item three. three. Come, comes to us from goskagit.com. I am not familiar with this. Go, Goska Git? I, mm, I don't know. Your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> All <though>. right. <laughs> well, the, anyway, <laughs> the weird weird name for the uh, news site, but uh, headline, good, good story and good headline, which reads, Gift registries after divorce offer a new way to support loved ones. For people putting a life back together after divorce, mundane household items can be painful marital reminders. Your thoughts on this one? Dave, I got to tell you, I love it. The Hmm. article quotes our two friends who were guests on the Shine On podcast a few episodes back, and they have an incredible gift registry, and I love it. But first, when we had Olivia on, I was skeptical. I, I was skeptical if, in fact, people were going to buy into this whole divorce registry. Right. right. And I thought about it, and we interviewed founders of, of, of the company, Fresh Start, and it was sold. I think it's such a great idea because people are going through such a hard time, such an emotional time. There's a loss. There might be a loss of the residence. There might be a loss of furniture. There might be a loss of the simplest things that someone enjoys. And if you can be a part of helping someone recover, if you can be a part of helping someone start the second chapter, if you can be a part of helping someone move ahead from the tough times to a bright future, I love it. I support it. What are your thoughts? Yeah. When you hear this, you might think the whole idea of a divorce registry is sort of contrived or forced or something like that. But if you think a little deeper and put yourself in the shoes of the person who's leaving their spouse after however however many years, the reminders of the marriage are going to be painful. It's So if you've got had a certain bedding set for so many years that you've shared with your spouse, and now all of a sudden you got to go back to the, those pillows and perhaps monogrammed pillows, monogrammed towels, and just being reminded of them, <clears throat> that's, that's uh, legitimately a trigger for sadness. So what do you do? You got a new life, you got a new start, get new pillows, get new salt shakers, get, get, get new everything. So I didn't have a divorce registry when I got divorced. I just went to Ikea, but you know, to each his own. If you had a divorce registry, mm-hmm. what would you want? Someone to get you. Lots of alcohol, Evan. Just start with the craft beer and move up to the hard stuff. Not. <laughs> Dave, I, I didn't know you at the time of your divorce, right? right. So I, I, I'm happy to start the Producer Dave <laughs> Divorce Registry. So you can say goodbye to the IKEA furniture. Not that there's anything wrong with IKEA furniture. I'm a big fan. But you know what? Let's set up the Producer Dave Registry. <laughs> Let's get that salt shaker. Let's get that craft beer. Let's get that battle, bottle of bourbon. And I know you're a big bourbon guy. That's right. Right? So yeah, let's get it going. Start that. Yeah. And then just a whole bunch of gift cards to Grubhub or something. That'll make, yeah, that'll make me happy. Hub, I don't ask yeah, for much. Red, Red Sox tickets. I mean, why stop at Grubhub <laughs> gift cards? Let's stay. You, you deserve better than that. Let's get on it right now. we get some Celtics tickets to the finals. A bunch of people can chip in for that. I think that would work. Mav, Mavs in six. Oh, I hope you eat your words. We'll see. Let's move on to Ask Evan, where we hear from you, the listener. Ask Evan. Ask Evan. Ask Evan. Ask Evan. The note today comes from Stanley in Mount Vernon, New York. Stanley writes as follows. 
I have a lot of properties and business interests. How do I determine what is considered marital property and what is not? Some of the stuff was acquired before the marriage. Evan, your advice for Stanley. Stanley, I know you're a loyal listener of the Shine Up podcast from the comments and the emails that you've sent in. So I appreciate you always listening to the podcast. And great question. I have to tell you that what you're asking about is essentially the fundamental piece of any divorce, right? Because when you talk about the marital pot, how you're going to divide it, you need to make a list, right? And create a list of the assets that you have. Identify that. Did you own them before the marriage? Or are they assets that you acquired during your divorce, right? It is an incredibly important part of the divorce process, given the businesses, given the property. You're likely going to have to bring on an expert, such as a business evaluator, or potentially a real estate appraisal, someone to help you identify what's separate, you want to keep that separate, what's marital, how is it going to be divided, or the marital assets going to be divided 50-50, or in some other way. But before, Stanley, you get to those questions, you first want to be able to identify and classify what's separate, what's marital, and how you could protect with your legal team the assets that you came into the marriage with. That's another edition of Ask Evan. If you want to submit a question for Evan to answer on the podcast, email producer Dave at david at pod617.com. Our featured guest on this week's episode of the Shine Up Podcast is Lisa Smith. Lisa is the author of the award-winning memoir, Girl Walks Out of a Bar. She's a speaker, recovery coach, former practicing attorney, and co-host of the Must Listen To Recovery Rocks podcast. Lisa, it's an absolute pleasure to have you on the podcast. Welcome. Thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm, I'm thrilled. And Lisa, there's a lot I want to get into on today's episode, your journey, your path, the highs and the lows, and how you navigated it all, which you detail brilliantly in your book, A Girl Walks Out of a Bar. So your book really explores addiction, recovery, the legal profession. How did your experiences in these areas shape your journey and influence the narrative of the memoir? Oh, sure. Well, my story, the the book really is the story of my descent into and then recovery from what people call, quote unquote, high functioning addiction to alcohol and cocaine in the world of big New York law firms. And I went through basically a 12 year downward spiral, primarily alcohol with cocaine at the end that took me from being a social drinker, I thought, to drinking each night. And then when I found people who drank at lunch, I was like, oh, well, it's not such a bad idea. People drink at lunch in France. And so I signed on for that. I got normalized. And and then eventually I started drinking in the morning and that, that last 18 months of it were 24-7 alcohol and cocaine around the clock. And the cocaine was not for fun. None of this was fun. Sure. <laughs> Some people have said to me like, oh, the party had to end sometime. And I'm always <laughs> like, what party? Yeah. I wasn't there. That's <laughs> So I I asked, ended up when I hit my bottom, as we would call it, recovery, I checked myself into a hospital because I knew I would need a medicated detox. I was too physically addicted to just stop. And I was there for five days. And then I refused to go for a uh, full on inpatient 30 day actual rehab, which is what they wanted me to do. And I instead insisted on going right back to work at my law firm. I was then a, a director of client development at a big firm. And I went to an outpatient rehab two nights a week. And I started writing sort of the story right out of the gate because I had hid everything from everyone and my family, my friends, work. I had gotten a nice raise and bonus the month before I checked myself in. I should say I stopped actually practicing after my sixth year of of practice in a big firm as a corporate associate. And I was doing just fine, but I realized the conversations we had in my six year review were like, great, you're on, you're on track. These are things we're, we're going to ask you to do sure. in the coming year now, starting into that stretch to try for partnership. And I knew 
I didn't want to do that. And I knew I couldn't do that with the way I was drinking at the time. And one of them had to go. So of course it, it was not going to be the alcohol. So I switched <laughs> over in that firm. I was able to switch over and start doing business development with the partners. Okay. And that's how my career on the administrative end started. But I, I really felt like when I got sober, I had a lot to explain to people. So I started writing it down. But then I, I really thought about how I started as lawyers love to read. I've always been a big reader. I'm ripping apart the bookshelves looking for sure. an addiction memoir with my story. And it, I didn't see it there. And so I knew I couldn't be the only one who was experiencing these kinds of things. So I really felt like I wanted to put it out there because I was fortunate enough to not have a hard landing. And I wanted to, you know, let the, really just let the next person who was going through what I had gone through uh, know that they were not alone and that it was okay to ask for help. The stigma of addiction kept me, you know, from, from doing anything earlier. And Lisa, your book offers a really raw and honest portrayal into addiction and also recovery. What's the message that you want readers to take away from the book? The message really is, is there is, there is hope. There is always hope and that it does get better, right? I wanted to show that people often think of this. I wanted to break the stereotype for one. I wanted them to see that people like them and like me who look like me, sound like me, have jobs like me, all of that. It happens to us too, and that's okay. It doesn't make us bad people. It doesn't mean there's something wrong with us, that this is something that we can sort of face head on. And then that it's, I had so much fear about what's life going to be like if I don't drink, right? Because it was what I did. It's what I did with my friends. It's what I did with my family. I had no sober references in my life. And I wanted to show people that this is what happens. People support you. You start doing better at work. I took a job 10 months after I got sober at a different firm that was like a big step up from, from where I had been. Because when you're quote unquote high functioning, you only are high functioning until the day you're not, right? Until the day you get a DUI, sure. until you miss a filing. And you're not functioning at a level that you could or might want to because you just can't do it. The way I was at the end, I couldn't have even interviewed for the job I ended up taking less than a year later. Wow. And Lisa, you mentioned the support. How would you describe the support that you received from friends and family when they first found out about the addiction and then on the path and road to recovery? It, it was, uh, so much of it was, like I said, behind closed doors oh. that, Everybody knew my friends drank, my family drank, everybody sure. drank and people knew I would drink too much, not infrequently. <laughs> and if it was with my mother, I say I spent the night at my parents' house. My mother would say in the morning, you drank too much last night. And I would say, yeah, I did. And she would say, but you don't do that all the time, right? You don't do that when you're in New York. And I'd be like, no, 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 I don't do that. <laughs> And with my friends, I would be out with them. I could go drink for drink with them. And then yep. they went home to bed. <laughs> Some of them had kids. They didn't see me go home and pull out another bottle of wine or pull out some Coke or whatever it was. And so when I called them the day that I checked myself in and said, hey, I've got a problem and I'm, I'm checking in, there was a lot of confusion there was a little bit of, come on, you're not that bad. There was also with some people sort of a feeling of betrayal of like, but mostly, mostly like the predominant feelings were, I had no idea, how can I help you? Or uh, I didn't know this was happening and I'm so glad you're doing this. How do we, the people who love and care about you are going to be there and are going to want to help. It was, they, and they still, that's the other thing too, is like a lot of people feel like, oh, you're friend, you're going to have to lose your whole friend group. If, you, if my, if my whole friend group was comprised of people I drank and stayed up doing drugs with all the time, yes, then I would have had to lose them. But I had friends throughout my life and, and family and they, your true friends stay with you. 
They absolutely do. And your family will too. It's a, a lot of times there's damage that needs to be repaired, sure. but that's re irreparable. And Lisa, you're, the title of the book is intriguing. And it also, it, it's a play on the old, the old school joke that begins with someone walking into a bar. So what significance does the title hold? And what's the meaning behind it? I was writing for years before I, I wrote in the mornings before I would go to work throughout. Like I said, I was a director of client development, a big firm. And then I went on to become a chief business development officer and then a deputy executive director. And so I was working very hard. I never told work. I never, whatever. I just went and continued to act like nothing had happened. And I would walk to, into my office in the mornings. It was about two miles away. And I, I would, part of where I'd walk through was the theater district in Times Square. And I would see people walking into those dive bars like I had done myself often at seven in the morning, eight <laughs> in the morning. And I was, I, one day it just kind of hit me that like, that's not me anymore. I've like, I've walked out of that bar. And also because of the legal thing, I thought bar was fun. You see, you, you touched on this in the beginning, but you're not the first young lawyer to struggle with addiction in as a young associate, big law firm. How does the big law model, how does that contribute to situations like you went through? I think the way what I do now is is a lot of speaking to law firms and law schools and bar associations and such and telling my story. And the way the way that it, it happened with me is that the legal profession, I always say, is soaked in alcohol because it is the nor it's the go to. I remember from the beginning when I was interviewing to be a summer associate, I remember the first thing every firm told me was we work hard and we play hard. And yep. that didn't mean like <laughs> we go out for a run after sure. we do something. It meant we go to the bar and we drink hard. Yep. And in fact, I think I was, this was in the nineties, a very long time ago, but in a way it helped me because I was one of the women who, and there weren't a lot of us who would go to the bar with the guys who would hang out with the partners, talk football, do all that stuff. And that's how lawyers tend to bond. And we do it. We do it in recruiting events, summer associate activities. Of course, we, we close a big deal and you have sure. a big yeah. closing dinner with all kinds of focus on the wine or you file a big brief and then everybody adjourns to the bar and it's how we socialize. So it's very normalized. And I think what that definitely fed into it, it was always, I saw so many people coping with the stress, the anxiety with all that stuff by drinking that why would I think I needed to do it any differently? And you hear so much about, to that point, there's so much talk about burnout. Burnout mm -hmm. in the workplace, burnout in the big law firm model with such an emphasis and focus still on the billable hours and, and the whole motto, work hard, play hard. What suggestions, if any, do you have for how to change the model that mm -hmm. would have an impact on young associates being brought up in the big law firm mentality and culture? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. I think what I, what I like to talk about is there it's, we don't need a crusade to tear alcohol out of law firms and do all of those things. But what we do need to do is recognize that the numbers tell us that at least 20% of practicing attorneys fall somewhere on this on the spectrum for an alcohol use disorder. There are real people suffering among us, right? Down the hall, wherever it is. And it shouldn't be incumbent on those people to make themselves feel comfortable if they seek sobriety or just decide not to drink or whatever it is. So it really, the message kind of needs to start at the top of, and this is the ABA has put out a guidance on this, and it's really to de-emphasize alcohol. And by de-emphasize, I mean, not necessarily having at every bonding event, there doesn't need to be alcohol. But even more importantly, I think, is normalizing the idea that not everyone at an event 
is going to be drinking that night and that that's okay, right? If some, if people going in, if the people putting together a summer associate program, right, say, understand that there's going to be a bunch of people who for religious reasons, for diet, for workout, or just not into it, don't drink, make it so that it's comfortable for everybody. And that means better alternatives to to alcohol just available so you don't everybody doesn't have to somebody who doesn't want to drink doesn't look like they stick out right there's something better for them there than just diet coke and seltzer at least as, as you look at your recovery journey is there a moment as you think back and as you put together the book and replayed life and, and the history of events in your mind is there one moment that's the pivotal moment for you in your recovery process? It's, uh, uh, there is, and and I put it in the book, but like, this is what stuck with me the most was, and it's kind of a weird story. It's, it's, it's not the story you might expect, but I checked in inadvertently into a really, really not, not good <laughs> psych hospital in New York to do the detox because I didn't know what I was doing. I'd asked my doctor, and the, I always tell people, don't ask your gastroenterologist where to go to detox. <laughs> I took, and we took the first place sure. with the bed. And there was a reason that was the first place with the bed. And it was, a, it, I, I talk, I write about it in the book, but I didn't know what was going on. And they gave me Librium to, de so I wouldn't, when you're detoxing from that kind of addiction, you can have a spike in your heart rate or a heart attack or just go into seizures. And so they give you Librium in the detox to calm that. So I remember being on Librium and they made me go to a group meeting and a, it, it was a 12 step meeting in, in the thing, but I was like, oh no, I didn't sign up for that. And they were like, yeah, you're going, <laughs> this is not optional. And so I remember the guy, I remember sitting there in a Librium haze and watching this guy just saying over and over, you do not pick up no matter what. I was in your chair. I don't, I don't ever want to be in your chair again. If you pick up, you will be in that chair again. If you're lucky, you do not pick up no matter what. And something in that moment just clicked. And I was like, this guy's telling the truth. Like next time, I may not be so lucky as to land in here. Wow, well, Lisa, that's that's an incredible story, and and I want to ask, what what's been the most rewarding part for you about sharing your story with the world? Oh, definitely hearing from other people that in some way they related or it helped them, or that that it helped them to understand. I mean, I really wanted, I really tried to get in my own head because I was trying to explain my whole self to my family and friends. That was the point of this writing. And that's why it feels like I'm telling somebody a story sitting on the couch because that's literally what it was. <laughs> and because of that, it's helped some people also to understand someone else in their life who has this, has this issue because- to someone on the outside, like my family and friends who were what we call, we in recovery call normies who could take it or leave it, they didn't know what had been going on in my head for so many years and what it is like to be in that position. And so if I can help explain that to someone who wouldn't otherwise know, and it helps them understand somebody else, I'm, I'm uh, any kind of help that, that the book can give to the next person is really what it's about. At least I know you're a big fan of rock music. And of yes. course, many musicians, they struggle with addiction. Is there, are there any recovering addicts in the world of music who serve as role models for you? Oh, for me, or from one of the first, I shouldn't even say, because I think I was probably sober about a year, a year and a half. There weren't, I read all the addiction memoirs when yeah. I came out. And <laughs> I loved uh, Anthony Kiedis from the Red Hot Chili Peppers, okay. his memoir "Scar Tissue." I, I would, and that gave me another little turning point in there where I was like, it, the stories in there, what he, what happened to him, the situations, and I remember early, like in days, thinking. If Anthony Kiedis can stay sober today, I can stay sober today. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like no, I love that. that. I love that. How, how does music help you cope? As a whether it's in the past, uh, ongoing, what what does music mean to you? 
music has been for me a way to lose myself to get out of my head and a lot of what i used to try and do with drinking and drugs was get out of my head right and and so in my recovery it's been huge like i will be when i am feeling overwhelmed i'm feeling anxious i'm feeling whatever if i put something on in if i realize oh i don't have any music on let me put something on it just it it gives my brain a distraction and something to focus on and I always, when I, I don't run anymore because <laughs> I can't anymore, but I walk. But w- when I was running, when I, when I go walking, I am like, it's almost like a meditation. It, it takes me into another zone and Who, who's on the, pl- let me ask who's on the playlist right now. Oh my God. Everyone, a lot of, yeah, a lot of, a lot of grateful dead, a lot okay. of, but like all kind. I have like club music from the nineties when I used to go to clubs with artists you've never heard of like that dance music. <laughs> I have every nine inch nails all the way to like Taylor Swift, like okay. anything that just. You talk about a wide range on the spectrum right there. Yeah. So yeah. You, you mentioned the, the, the clubs, you mentioned the partying, the nightlife, and you walked away from all of that for a good reason. Do you ever think about those nights? Do you ever miss that part of your life? I can be a little nostalgic for it at times, yeah. right? Like, oh, I remember a few years in one of my friends who is actually one of the main characters in the book too. She said to me like, don't you miss like having a glass of wine at out to dinner or whatever? And my answer is always, I never had a glass of wine. That wasn't how I, how I drank, but like, no, what I don't miss, I don't miss that. But sometimes would I love a good night where I was like, I'll never pick up over that for a glass of wine, but I, it's never really been a close call. But it, if I were to, I was like, I would be getting a half gallon of vodka an eight ball of cocaine, two packs of cigarettes, and we'd have a night. And yeah. the friend was like, well, you better call me if you do that. <laughs> Meanwhile, she's one of my biggest supporters in recovery because we know it Which won't happen. Great. But yeah, I'd yeah. shoot the lights out. If- yeah. How did your divorce impact addiction and also recovery my divorce was something one more like a lot of what i did and i think a lot of people do was i drank at things or i drank at people right like oh i'm so this partner didn't like what i turned in i'm i'm so upset i need a drink right so a divorce is gives you gives somebody like me in that stage a ton of mileage. Like you can drink over a divorce for a very long time. And it was at the same time that I was coming back to New York right after September 11th in 2001. Yeah. And I don't know if you were in the city then, but the city was just a dark place. And it was like, I got to, I brought my divorce with me and just dove right into the darkest parts of it. So it did that. And in my, in my recovery, I am, I, I have, it taught me a lot of lessons and having gone through that experience, I think informed. I now, when I, when I was at a year and I'm 20 years sober now. Um, oh, wow. For, yes, yeah, that's wonderful. Thanks. After the first year and a half, I met my now husband. And we've been married. We've been together since 2005. We got married in 2008. And I wouldn't know how to be in a marriage if I hadn't gone through what I did before. Wow. Wow. What are some of the biggest changes you've noticed in yourself since achieving sobriety? I take less shit from people. I think, oh, am I allowed I to love swear? It. Of course you're allowed to swear oh, okay. on, the, on the podcast. I love that. Okay. Tell, tell, tell me about that. Because... There is a feeling, and I like when I speak for people to understand this also when I talk to audiences, is it is hard to do, to get sober and to, you know, change your life. And it's a pretty badass thing to do. And I want to own that. I don't want to be, I've never been one to be embarrassed by the fact that I'm in recovery or that, that I don't drink. Like, that's not embarrassing to me. Like, I can own that and feel you know, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger, right? So recovery really, it taught me how to set boundaries in a lot of of ways with what is and is not acceptable to me. And I'm, gave me the confidence to not 
be willing to compromise those boundaries without a really good reason. I used to let, I was such a people pleaser, like a lot of us are, right? And now I want to please you if it's if it's mutually the right thing. Yeah, no, of course. But no, I totally, totally if get I'm that. not, like I'll draw a hard line. How do you navigate situations when alcohol is present? And what would your advice be to other people, other attorneys or anyone who's listening, who let's use the example of they're in a summer associate program. We're recording this episode about to turn the page on May going into June. Many summer associate programs are starting. What would your advice be to people when alcohol is present, where they're just not interested for whatever the reason is? I think the my advice would be the simplest thing. If someone offers you a drink or asks, why aren't you drinking or whatever? The answer is just, I'm not drinking. I'm not drinking tonight. No, thanks. I'm not drinking tonight. You don't have to explain. I mean, recovery. I, you know, I, I had to get sober or something like that or anything else. Like your story is your own. No one else is entitled to it unless you choose to share it. And I think this goes back to the point where I said, you know, what I try to do in speaking is to normal is to make normal that answer to a quest to the question, right? So that firms have something set up. So it's easier for somebody to say, I'm going to pass on it. I'll give you one one good story on that. Sure. When when I left, before I left, I retired from law firms altogether in 2019. And before that, we had given a 100th anniversary party for the firm. And so we did a whole big thing. We went, it was at Rockefeller Center. There were 300 people. We invited clients, alums, all kinds, people, friends of the firm. And we would always do, have kind of a signature cocktail. And we had started having a signature non-alcoholic cocktail or a mocktail at the bar. But when, and so that night we had a pomegranate margarita and a virgin mojito. And they took the pomegranate margaritas up to the front so that when people came in, you could grab a margarita or you could grab a white wine or a glass of salt or a flute of seltzer. Sure. And so we decided to move up also the non-alcoholic, the virgin mojitos, just to see. And it was a Tuesday night and the virgin mojitos flew off, wow. right? They were so popular. I had a client come up to me and say, I just want to thank you for having this available because <laughs> after here, I have to get on a train and I'm doing homework with my kid and I really wow. didn't want to drink tonight, but you know, but I figured it's your celebration. I'll drink, but now that thank you for doing this. So I don't have to have alcohol. You know? yeah. So that kind story. of thing, like we don't realize Sometimes, or a lot of people don't realize, I never realized that a lot of people just don't give too much thought to alcohol, right? Yeah. Like I always That's thought every, that everybody was looking at what I was drinking or how I was drinking. The people who paid the most attention were the people that maybe needed to look at their own drinking, that, right? That is true. Lisa, you have this awesome podcast, Recovery Rocks. Give us a memorable episode or tell us something unique about the podcast. Sure. Well, it is, it's a buddy podcast. <laughs> it is, it's me. So me, the Gen X lawyer, 20 years of recovery in, in AA and always 30 years in professional office. And a friend, my friend, Tawny, who is 20 years younger than me, she's a millennial. She's never worked in a office job. She got sober on the internet. Like we're totally different, but we <laughs> Bonded over rock and roll. Her dad was a bass metal guitarist. Oh, wow. And yeah. And so we thought it would be cool because we come at everything from such different angles to do different topics on recovery. It's been now, we have over like 220 something episodes and we've been doing it for almost six years. And I, I would say a highlight recently, uh, there've been a lot of highlights. We've been really lucky, but I don't know if you know who Art Alexicus is from Everclear. He's the lead singer of the band okay, Everclear. Sure. Yep. He came I know on. a little bit of rock and roll. I bet you do. I bet you do. <laughs> and so he came on and we got okay. to talk to him about 
one of their most iconic songs called Father of Mine and what that was about and going back into it. And he's sober for many, many years. And to be able to actually be with a real rock star talking about his music and recovery was sort of a mind blowing thing. That's awesome. That's awesome. Lisa, I want to bring on producer Dave, who's the rock star of the Shine On podcast and who also has the Nine Inch Nails and Taylor Swift on his playlist for a fun segment that we do on the podcast called They Said It. <laughs> they Said It. They Said It. They Said It. Uh, typically on They Said It, we provide some famous quotes from people and then just have you uh, react, Lisa, in any way you want to sort of interpret what we're talking about. This is a special rock and roll edition of They Said It in recognition of you being here, Lisa. So I'm going to give you uh, three quotes from rock and roll songs and then sort of ask you something about it. The bonus is you can you can guess if you want to. I didn't mean to put you on the spot. Lisa's un- unprepared for this, but... If you want to guess where it comes from, you you might be able to. You are a fan. First quote comes, first lyrical excerpt reads as follows. I used to do a little, but a little wouldn't do it. So the little got more and more. I just keep trying to get a little better, said a little better than before. Does that ring a bell, Lisa, or no? It doesn't. Okay. I'm sure it should. No, Who is it? It's not. It wasn't a hit, but it was. it's a Guns N' Roses song. <laughs> it's Mr. Brownstone, a song that they wrote. It's my favorite song about heroin, which is it's just uh, it's just a joke. But <laughs> well, I know, I love yeah, I I do love GNR. I actually saw them, but I used to do a little, but a little one too. Yeah. So yeah, so this, I, I'd love to hear if that rings true to you in any way. So tell us. Yeah. Um. Yeah. By the way, my favorite Guns N' Roses song about heroin is My Michelle. Okay. <laughs> you try to make a joke about having more than one song about heroin. Of course, Guns N' Roses yeah. has more than one song about heroin. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That is a great um, song. Yeah. yeah. This this quote is spot on because this is how it feels. Like the, the, And this is why I identify with so much of this music is they sing about addiction. People who haven't been there, haven't have no knowledge of it, really wouldn't recognize it. But this is so what somebody goes through, right? Mm. I I did a little and then I noticed one glass of wine at night after work became three, became whatever. And you keep thinking it's going to fix you and it doesn't. And it before you know it, it gets away from you. Yeah, and I mean, I think I found it interesting that you said there there really was no party for you. It, it was almost like your mind was doing the best job it could to fix the situation. If I yes. take a little more of this, then yeah. this will be a little better. This right. will fix it. This will right. fix it. Yep. Yeah. All right, we'll move on to quote number two. I have a pretty good idea that you're going to know this one, Lisa. The, yeah, the, I do know this the, one. <laughs> I don't ever want to feel like I did that day. Take me to the place I love. Take me all the way. That is, of course, the Red Hot Chili Peppers the Red Hot under Chili the Peppers, bridge. Peppers, right? Yeah. Here it is, right here. I don't ever feel like I did that day. You mentioned Anthony Kiedis. He, of course, wrote this yeah. song about his days of of addiction, and yeah. at first, he didn't even want to record the song. He was doing it sort of as a poem, as a self help exercise. And by the way, the mystery still looms as to what bridge he's talking about. And everybody wants to know what it is, and he won't tell anyone. Anyway, I guess what I'd ask you on this one. We know it's in L.A. We know it's in L.A., the city of angels. Yeah, so he he, he talks about, I, I guess my question to you on the subject of this quote is, where is the line between remembering things from the past as an inspiration to to stay on the track that you're on, or really trying to set aside things that remind you of those days. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. It does. And I think the line of remembering what it felt like is is always so scary, but it's so important to remember. And the best analogy I kind of have to that is when you have a, a drunk dream or a using dream, which happens to me, mm. and I wake up, and it's pretty common with people from time to time. I've always had them more, I think, than other people. But when I wake, it'll be really real, and I'll wake up, and I'll be like, oh my God, thank God that didn't happen. I'm yeah, still wow. Okay, yeah. You know? 
So that uh, they're a good reminder is what they are. Yeah. Wow, that's funny. You can, we, get, you can forget. And we all have dreams where we wake up and we say, thank God it didn't. That's that's interesting that yours might be as simple as... as oh, sit, yeah. You, yeah. All right. Final quote for They Said It reads as follows. Oh, but now you just don't remember all the things you said and you're not sure you want to know. I'll give you one hint, honey. You sure did put on a show. Who's that, Lisa? Billy Joel, Big Shot. You got it. Now you just don't remember all the things you said and you're not sure that you want to know. You didn't know you were going to get to play and name that tune today on the Showdown Podcast. <laughs> this is a great, great game. This is awesome. So with, the, um, with this one, one of Billy Joel's great rocking tunes from the 52nd Street album, of course, but he sings about someone who just had to be a big shot. And I guess you can comment on it any way you like, Lisa, but I, I'm wondering... When you have a friend or someone, and it's happened to all of us, where people are out having a good time, and there's one person that's just having too good a time and maybe embarrasses themselves, and what do you do? What what is, is that something that is easy for you to, to approach someone, or sh- should it be easy for us? Should we go to our friends when this happens? How do we do it? Yeah, I mean, I think certainly if you see it, a one-off is not necessarily something to get concerned about. But if you keep seeing it, um, it's, I think, the way we always talk about this and the way that I think is easy to say, the worst thing that could have happened to me on a night that I blacked out, which there were lots of them, would be if somebody said, oh, my God, you, you... I can't believe what you did last night or what you said last night. That's the way to make the person close up and run away. Mm. But just like a kind of, hey, just checking in with you. Is everything okay? How you doing? And certainly giving that person space to talk. And certainly if, if it's kind of a regular thing, it's like, hey, you haven't seen yourself lately. I, and you can point out what you noticed. I noticed you're having more drinks when we go out than you used to. Is everything okay? Because, and this is what I tell law students and lawyers too, is like, check yourself on this. Like, I never thought about checking myself, but check yourself. Like, if you were somebody who used to go to the bar two nights a week, and now you're going five, is it because you love the bar that much more this week? Or is it because something else is going on? Mm. So, no, I would definitely say approach somebody with compassion when you see bad stuff going on. Yeah, I mean, nobody likes to be embarrassed. Nobody likes to, oh hear, my God. Nobody likes to hear that. And so it, you, you want to preserve the friendship. So you want to do it delicately, I think. But but yeah, yes. um, you, you also don't want to let that person slip away. And you also don't no. want to let that person do something that's going to hurt themselves, of course. Yeah. So No, no. And letting them know that you're there unconditionally without judgment is the best way. One final question, Lisa. What's the best concert you ever saw? Oh, boy, <laughs> there's so many. I, I, I could even say, I could go back so far to say my first concert, which was Fleetwood Mac at Madison Square Garden oh, on wow. the Tusk tour. Mm-hmm. So all the way back. I think I would have to say, I'm going to kind of, Guns N' Roses at the Garden was was way up there. And it's different shows, right? So like seeing No Doubt at a little club in New York. Mm -hmm. Um, But then probably the most would be for me, those every uh, fall, the before Jerry Garcia died, the Grateful Dead used to do nine nights at Madison Square Garden. And I would always be like, I'm only going to three. I'm only going to three. And I'd end up going to like six or seven. And those shows were consistently my favorite shows, just because the whole thing, the whole vibe, not necessarily that it was the best musical experience. Tom Petty at the Beacon Theater was great musically. I would oh, say that too. That's good. I think everything, everybody you mentioned, I think is in with, I'm not sure about No Doubt, in the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. They might be in too. One day you should, you should look at the list and see how many you've seen. Cause I bet you've, I bet, I've there's seen a bunch. A lot. There's a- I grew up in Jersey, so I have a lot of Springsteen <laughs> under my belt from like 1980. Sure, sure. Yeah. Yeah, well, those are terrific answers. I don't suppose Fleetwood Mac had the USC marching band with them that night. When they, they did when not they at the basketball. garden that night. No, no. <laughs> I, I'll listen to that song anytime. It's one of the most creative. I love that song. It's, it's uh, those drum beats just 
they they can get you going on on any morning. And really, yeah. a, a, an, a, almost an odd departure for Fleetwood Mac, which is known for much different. Totally. Kind. Yeah. Totally. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, we can talk music all day, but we'll <laughs> for now we'll thank you, Lisa and Evan. Turn it back to you to wrap things up. Dave, that was awesome. At least I have to tell you, this was absolutely fantastic. I want to thank you for coming on the podcast. Your story, your journey, your path, your memoir. A girl walks out of a bar. It's inspiring. Thank you for spending some time thank with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's an honor to be with you, really. And and thank you for what you're doing. And Lisa, tell everybody where they could pick up a copy of the book, learn more about you, and reach out. Sure. The book is everywhere books are sold, and it's on all formats. And I am at Lisa Smith Advisory with an O dot com. And the only social media I do is on Instagram. And on Instagram, I am Girl Walks Out. Fantastic. Lisa, it was a pleasure. Thank you so much. Take care. Episode 76. It's in the books. What an absolutely fantastic show today. A lot of fun. We had a star studded celebrity professional sports docket orchestrated by the one and only the brilliant producer dave i'm just happy to be part of the team evan taking it day by day and the good lord willing we'll put out the best darn podcast we can Uh, speaking of the best darn podcast we can how fantastic how brilliant how inspiring was our guest today lisa smith recovery coach author of the wonderful memoir a girl walks out of a bar we had some incredible moments with her and a lot of fun on the podcast today. A big shout out and a big thank you to Lisa. She was fantastic. To all the listeners, thank you for listening. You can listen to the podcast, Apple, Spotify, Stitcher, Pod 617. Producer Dave, this was a blast as always. I'm Evan Shine, and I'll talk to you again real soon.